This is my Bible. I am what it says I am. I can have what it says I can have. Today, I'm ready to receive the incorruptible, ever-living seed of the Word of God. Come, Holy Spirit, have your way in this place. Come, Holy Spirit, have your way in my life. I'll never be the same again. Come on. Never, never, never. In Jesus' name, amen. High five the person next to you and give a shout. This morning, I want to talk to you something that's uh, dear to my heart that I think will challenge you that years ago, uh, God just did a work in my heart supernaturally. I learned what I'm going to share with you today. And uh, it is, I hope you got a card when you came in the door. The card when you came in is a sentence card that we do every week through the summer. We may continue with it past the summertime, but it is a summertime thing that we're doing. And the card says, I am, and then it's a blank. And we've been filling in the blank every single week together. We've been going through the card together and laying it out of who we are in Christ. So when it says, I am, we're talking about the people we are in Jesus out of Romans chapter 8. What does it mean to belong to Jesus Christ? How many of you have enjoyed it this summer? Hey, I've been learning a lot myself and who we are in Christ. Here's what I want you to fill in today. I want you to fill this in, if you will. I want you to fill in the phrase, I am planted. I am planted. I want to talk to you this morning about what it means to be planted. Um, because it's such a misunderstanding in today's consumer society we become consumers of church rather than being planted in a church. And by consumers, I mean we come and we just want to get something out of it rather than putting our life there and growing through it. And uh, in today's generation, especially when there's a church on every corner, uh, consumer Christianity is a pretty fair thing for all of us to participate in. In other words, if you get mad here, you can just hop up and go somewhere else. If you get mad there, you can go somewhere else. If you don't like my preaching today, you can YouTube a preacher on YouTube and enjoy them. So I think it's all fair to say there's enough religion and ministry and preachers and good ones out there that if we're not careful, we can become more of a consumer of Christianity than planning our life in the kingdom and becoming effective at Christianity. And we just consume it. Uh, you may have your favorite people you listen to. I have mine. I'll share a few of them with you in case you want to go try them out a little bit. One of them is very famous, T.D. Jakes. I listen to him because he inspires me. Every time he preaches, I'm waiting on Jesus to come back. I always leave inspired. And I, you can ask Robin, every time I listen to him, I end up crying. And I think this man is just brilliant how he preaches. And I usually tear up and cry. I also love to listen to Robert Morris. If you've never listened to Robert Morris, I would encourage you to go on YouTube and just type in Robert Morris. All of his videos will pop up. Um, he is a great teacher out of Texas, uh, spirit-filled. He just does a wonderful job. He challenges me. I love him because he is truly a spirit-filled pastor. And I listen to him for encouragement. I listen to him to challenge my life. I also listen to somebody, if you ever want to hear somebody and feel stupid, anybody like to hear those people where you just go, how can someone be so brilliant? Uh, I encourage you to type this in YouTube, maybe check him out, Chuck Missler, M-I-S-S-L-E-R, Chuck Missler. If you like to go deep and make your head swell and scratch with, oh my Lord, how can somebody be so brilliant? Listen to Chuck Missler. And then my favorite of all time that mom and dad have uh, kind of poured into me, into my life. I love this guy. He's passed on to heaven now, but a lot of his teachings are out there. Is Derek Prince. Uh, and I love to listen to him. He is just a great Bible teacher, and it grows you up. So I, I just kind of gave you those because those are, the, those are the guys, the ladies, the ministry that I follow and listen to, and they encourage me outside just beyond this house. So I, I want you to understand that, that it's out there. But now on the other side of it's out there, how many of you know anything you want to believe is out there? Come on, anything you want to believe. If you want to believe in aliens, you'll find videos about aliens. Uh, if, you, if you want to find Jesus is coming back in September, you'll find videos that he's coming back in September. 
So there, there's something about consumerism, Christianity, if you're not careful, you can get caught up in error and be following the wrong thing and nobody ever know it. Uh, so you have to be kind of careful with who you're out there, you know, especially today in today's world. You have to be careful online and through social media, you know, who you're following around because you can find any crazy person preaching Jesus, right? So uh, I just challenge you to be careful. But I think this today may help you know how to be careful, and it's called be planted. When your life is planted, things begin to change supernaturally. I think a lot of reasons we don't see the kingdom of God in our life many times is we don't understand how to be planted into a local house. And it's tough today because today when you say the word planted, it, it, it slaps in the face of this uh, thinking that God just wants you happy all the time. Because when you're planted, come on planted people, when you're planted you're not always happy. Right. <laughs> if you want to be a consumer Christian, you can always be happy because as soon as the preacher does something you don't like, you can just go eat off another buffet. Or as soon as somebody offends you and rubs you the wrong way, you'll just go to another church and go, I don't like those people at all. But I have found this to be true. If you want to flourish, now write this down because this is where we're going to go today. If you want to flourish... In your Christian walk, in your life, in your marriage, in your health, in uh, everything you're doing, parenting, you're going to have to be planted. And the reason God wants to do this is for you to flourish. And, and that means that somewhere in there, somebody's going to rub you the wrong way. You're not going to always be happy, and it's going to be for a reason. God's going to confront you to take you to another level. And we don't go to another level by being happy. We go to another level by gaining wisdom and becoming obedient to wisdom. And so, you know, if you're at Believer's Church and you're a member here and you belong here, I think you can understand we throw the gospel out there to you. And sometimes it makes us go higher and sometimes it challenges us and sometimes it makes us laugh and sometimes it makes us cry. Now, at the end of the message, I'm going to ask you a question. I'm going to throw it up on the screen at the end, but I want you to go ahead and ponder it. And this is what I want you to start asking yourself as we teach today. Holy Spirit, what is it you want to say to me through this message? Right? Holy Spirit, what do you want to say to me? I, I prayed over it. I've asked the Lord what to give me. God gave it to me. I'm going to give it to you. But the beauty of this transaction from heaven to us it, to myself and then to us as a family of believers. The beauty of that is the Holy Spirit. Now, here's here's the good thing. I love what Michael said during worship. You're not here by mistake. Amen. If you're in the door today, then that means there's something in this room God wants to get a hold of you with. It may have come through the worship. It may have come through Robin's exhortation. It may have come through the message. There's something God wants you to go out with because he wants you to flourish. Genesis chapter 2. Let's go there, if you will, in your Bibles. First book of the Bible, chapter 2, verse 8. Genesis, chapter 2, and verse 8. And then keep your finger in the New Testament, because we're going to go to the New Testament in just a moment. Genesis 2, verse 8. Then the Lord God planted a garden in Eden in the east, and there he placed the man he had made. Verse 9. The Lord God made all sorts of trees grow up from the ground, trees that were beautiful and produced delicious fruit in the middle of the garden. And he placed the tree of life and the tree of knowledge of good and evil. Here's the first thing I want you to know today is that God plants you in a place you'll flourish. He started the kingdom out. He started all of eternity with us, the timeline we humans live in. I want you to know how God started it. He didn't start it by saying this, Adam, where would you like to live? He planted the garden, and then he put Adam into the middle of it. And Adam in the middle of the garden, there was everything he needed for life. There was everything he needed to flourish. There was everything he needed for joy. Now watch how beautiful this is. This is where it gets really tricky. And the stuff that wasn't in the garden... That he could have said, I'm just so lonely here. There's nobody here to love me. There's nobody here that cares about me. There's nobody here that knows how I feel. I've been trying to share my feelings with Mr. Giraffe and he's just not getting it. 
He could have easily come up with a reason to pout why he was placed in the garden. Because there was nobody like him in the garden. But here's what you need to know in planting. Everything you lack, when you are planted, God will do a miracle to fill the void. Come on again. Everything you lack in your life, it's not going to be found in the clubs. It's not going to be found in a bottle. It's not going to be found in pills. It's not going to be found in another hookup. It's not going to be found in smoking weed if we legalize weed. It's not going to be found in winning the lotto. Hallelujah. If you get 333 million, take me to lunch. The (laughs) Bible. I really, I'm just going to be honest, I want more than lunch. If you win, you win $333 million, and I hear people, oh, I'll tie to your church. I ain't talking about God, I'm talking about me. Just, God will get his, just hook a brother up, you know? Give me my own. You know? I'm a little selfish maybe, but <laughs> I think we're all honest about that one. But, but here's what you have to know. Everything you lack in your life, and watch how important this is. Everything you lack in your life that you feel like marriage may solve it, sex may solve it, money may solve it, a job may solve it, drugs may solve it, people may solve it, a new husband, a new wife may solve it. If I could lose weight, if I could get nipped and tucked, if I could, whatever you got to do, literally, whatever you got to do, if I could do that, I would be happy. Now, what you have to understand is that's not where happiness abides. I'm not saying some things can't make us happy, but that's not the land of happiness. The land of perfect contentment, write this down on your card, take notes, do something. The land of perfect contentment. So those of you that are tweeters, tweet it. The land of perfect contentment. The land of perfect contentment is the place where God plants you. Hashtag. I'm planted. The land of perfect contentment is the place that God plants you. Now this smacks into the face of this culture. This culture doesn't understand being planted. This culture understands make me happy. We even do it in church by saying this. Uh, I'm not against church people, but we, we do this as Christians. Hey, we want you to come in the door. We're going to give you a, you know, a quick service. We're going to cattle brand you and send you back out. We're going to give you a little experience with God and then go do your life. That's okay with me, but that's not being planted. You showing up for a 30-minute sermon to get a word to feel better about your conscience is not being planted. Because how many of you know, I mean, just honest with one another, the truth of the matter is you can go to church and hide. You can hide. Uh, You can hide from people. You can hide your problems, hide your secrets. You can hide your fears. You can hide your sins. And but when you're planted, oh, it'll come out. It'll come out. Now, the beauty of that is I want a house here. I want a house where now watch, write this down. I want a house where being planted is safe. Right? Not sorry, but safe. Because a lot of reasons we don't plant is we don't feel safe to plant because I don't know what these people are about. And I don't want to put myself somewhere that I'm going to get hurt. I don't want to put myself somewhere that I'm going to get wounded. I don't want to put myself somewhere I'm going to have to risk relationships with people. And I just want to teach you how to flourish today out of Genesis 2. But the thing I need you to get in your mind, this is not a membership thing. I'm not going to ask you to join the church after this is over. I am going to ask you to pray that, that question, what is the Holy Spirit saying to you? So are you a consumer? Or are you willing to be planted in a house? Turn in your Bibles, if you will, to Corinthians chapter 12. 1 Corinthians chapter 12. 1 Corinthians chapter 12, if you love to study your Bible, it's a good passage of scripture about about church being a body. And um, I want to start reading in verse 12, 1 Corinthians 12, verse 12, and I'm going to read all the way down to about verse, about verse 20. The human body has many parts. Everybody say amen to that? We, We agree with that. But the many parts make up the whole body. So it is with the body of Christ. 
Some of us are Jews, some are Gentiles, some are slaves, some are free. But we've all been baptized into one body by one spirit and we share the same spirit. Yes, the body has many different parts, not just one. Look at the person next to you and just say this. Say, I'm glad you're different. Oh, that's a healthy thing. Matter of fact, look at the person on the other side and say, being different is healthy. All right. Look around the church today. Let's just play the game. Look around the church. Do you see people that look different than you? That's healthy. If everybody's white, we're in trouble. We won't have any rhythm. We can't clap. <laughs> I mean, I got moves, but I can do the robot, you know. Uh, if everybody's just one color, if we're all black, if we're all, uh, you know, what, I, I'm not saying that every place that may not be true because some place we may not have the racial mix up that we have here. But this is healthy. Some people wearing ties, some people wearing jeans, some people tatted up, some people no tattoos at all. Some people with nose rings, some people with lip rings, some people who smell like cigarettes, some people who, who look like they may not bathe in a while. But guess what? If we don't know how to tolerate the differences and love the differences in us, then we're not the true body of Christ. Because there's just differences. We're all at a different place in our walk with God, and God's moving us to, now watch, He's moving us to flourish. So some of us aren't quite, you know, giving off some fruit yet. We're still kind of down here in the dirt being planted, but we're in a place of flourishing. Now watch as we read on. Verse number 14. Yes, the body has many different parts, not just one. If a foot says, I'm not part of the body because I'm not a hand, that doesn't make it any less part of the body. And if the ear says, I'm not part of the body because I'm not an eye, would that make it less, any less part of the body? No, it says, if the whole body were an eye, how would you hear? And if your whole body were an ear, how would you smell anything? But, underline this in your Bible, this is where I want to stay but our bodies have many parts, and God, underline that now, and God has put each part just where he wants it. Now watch how this works. God put each part just where he wants it. That means if you're not where God wants you, somebody's going to be missing out. Because God puts you where he needs you to accomplish what has to be accomplished. Deuteronomy 16, if you love to study this out, the Lord said, I'll choose where you bring your offering to. You don't choose it, I get to choose it. So there is something about God and his kingdom when he's dealing with us as church people. We have to leave the health club mentality. I go wherever I want to go and I hop all over town to where I get the best deal that fits me the best. The church is not a health club. It's not a restaurant where you get to pick where you want to eat. The church is a planting. God takes a group of people. He puts them together for a purpose. He plants them in a community for a purpose. And they are planted together so that that community may flourish because of those people. And God hooks you up. Now, that is so foreign, but I want to teach you that this is the kingdom of God. God plants you so you can flourish. In other words, he's trying his best to hook you up with other people so that your life will flourish right where you are. Now, this, is, this is, becomes the problem if he's trying to hook you up with other people so that you can flourish. Now we've got to start asking, what are the things that I'm going to get if I plant, and what am I going to have to deal with if I plant? Right? 1 Corinthians 12. So look at the person next to you. Say this. There's something in you I probably need. I'm going to find out what it is. Right? Right? There's something in you I need. Reggie, there's something in you I need. Matt, there's something in me you need. We all need each other. If you're just thinking you all need me, then you've made me an idol. I need you as well. I need you to help me be a better man. 
I need you to help me grow in my faith. I can't do it alone. I know I like to stand up here and pretend like I got all my stuff together, but I don't. don't. We need each other to do it. Now let's go to the book of Ephesians. We're going to stay here a while. And I want you to understand this about being planted. What God is trying to do out of Corinthians 12 is being planted gives you a place to call home. Being planted gives you a place to call home. So what you have to understand is that when you're planted, when you're planted, it's it's God trying to give you a spot to call home. He wants you to come to a place of knowing what to do. So church is not just something. Let's hold off on this one for a minute, if you will. Church is not just something that you um, like a hotel. It's a home. Now, the difference in a hotel and a home is this. The difference between a hotel and a home, I can trash a hotel, somebody's going to clean it up. Thank God for the maid. She's going to come by, clean up my mess, clean up my towels, iron everything, put brand new sheets on. I can live like a slob, come back an hour later, it's heaven. Mints on my pillow. I've been married 26 years to this woman, never had a mint on my pillow yet. I'm just saying. Men, there's a difference between a maid and a wife. God doesn't give you a wife so you can have a maid. If I, I've noticed this about Robin. If I leave all my stuff out at home, I come back and it greets me. <laughs> Hello, I'm glad you're back. Pick me up now. Clean me up. If I leave my hotel and come back, my stuff's nicely put away. Now, church planted is a home. Meaning this, you have a responsibility here. There's something God wants you to do here. You can't just leave it up to a handful of people and treat other people like maids, mess it up and run home. If you're planted somewhere, it's an ownership thing. And now that's a different concept too, an ownership thing versus just I'm a member, I run in, I give money, I leave. Uh, Being a home and being planted means we all have a responsibility to help each other. Your grass needs mowing, we'll help you. You need help in your marriage, we'll help you. We're here to help you. That's what the body of Christ does. Now I want to read it to you out of Ephesians chapter 6. If you'll turn there, I want to teach you how in the world do you stay planted with a group of people who are so different than you? How do you stay planted with a group of people who are different than you. It's easy to be planted on Facebook. You can just delete them. But when you're in a home, we can't delete each other, right? So I can't get rid of you. You can't get rid of me. All right? Ephesians chapter 6, verse 10. Here is a final word. Be strong in the Lord and in his mighty power. Now, he said it's a final word. So he's going to nail it home. Watch what he says. Put on God's armor so that you will be able to stand firm against the strategies of the devil. Now here's the strategies of the devil. For we're not fighting against flesh and blood enemies, but against evil rulers and authorities of the unseen world, against mighty powers in this dark world, and against evil spirits in heavenly places. Here's what being planted will teach you. Being planted allows you to see people are not your problem. People are not your problem. I know that's shocking to some of us. Because you could name five right now that are your problem. But people are not the problem. Now, it's easy to be planted when I understand people are not the problem. You're not my issue. I'm not your issue If there are things amiss in my life, there are spiritual things happening to thwart me to make me think a human is my problem, but a human is not my problem. Now, until you grab hold of this, you'll never be able to be planted because the devil will deceive you to get away from these people because they irritate the hound out of you. But probably the reason they're irritating you is God's trying to expose something in you so you can flourish. But if you keep running every time he's trying to expose, you never flourish because it never gets exposed because you're running every time you're dealing with the people that frustrate you. But the reason they frustrate you is that's the very thing God's trying to deal with in your life. 
That's the thing that the Lord's trying to do. Let's switch now. That's the thing the Lord's trying to do. The Lord is trying to flourish you. But to flourish you, he's going to put you with people, I guarantee you, that irritate you. Somebody say amen. amen. The whole house should have said amen. The mentality we have is the moment my wife irritates me and my secretary makes me happy, adios honey, I'm going with my secretary to make me happy. Because flourishing doesn't happen when there's a people problem in the mind of most people. So I come up and say, Mark, pray God give me a new job. Get me away from these crazy people. Pray that God just do something. Get me away from these crazy... Now I understand those prayers because people can be frustrating and irritating. But I need you to understand when you're constantly praying for God to get you away from people, there's probably something in your life God is trying to expose so you can flourish. Why does that person irritate you so much? Why are they becoming your enemy? Why aren't you praying for their betterment and their blessing? What is it? And so you have to begin to ask yourself, what are those things that people aren't my problem? Now here's what they are. Turn back a chapter, if you will, to chapter 4. I want to show you something about people in Ephesians chapter 4. And I want to read in verse 14. Listen to this. Then we'll no longer be immature like children. We won't be tossed and blown about with every wind of new teaching. We will not be influenced when people try to trick us with lies so clever they sound like the truth. Instead, we will speak the truth in love, growing in every way more and more like Christ, who is the head of his body, the church. He makes his whole body fit together perfectly. Come on, say perfectly. I know it doesn't feel perfect with that person that irritates you. But there's something perfecting about it. What do they say in the business world? Iron sharpens iron. Well, what God is doing is people perfect you. Hang out with somebody you don't like and watch how they perfect you if you don't kill them. Right? I mean, it's just, it's a perfecting thing. Now watch what he says. He says they fit together perfectly as each part does its own special work. In other words, the only way this works is you can't be lazy. You can't go to church and just say, I'm going to sit here and do doodly squat. Doodly squat is a word from the south that means nothing. I'm doing doodly squat. I just want to come. I just want to be a consumer. I want to get in the door, get out the door, whatever it is, go home. The way God has destined this to be is that you have to have a special work. Now, do you believe this about yourself? That you, every person in this room, regardless of where you've come from, where you're going, or what your past stories entails, there is a special work in you. You have something to contribute today. You say, wait a minute, I'm not even on a team. I'm not on a serve team. I'm not talking about serving. I'm talking about there's just something in you today that can help another human being. And it might not even be in this building. It might be out at Ingalls or Publix, but you have to wake up going, there is a special work in my life, and I'm on this planet for that special work. And it just might be trimming hedges for your neighbor, but there is a special work for me to do. And because of me, the planet, me helping the other parts grow. How many of you know not everybody in the room feels like they're helping me grow? Right? Right? I feel like some people are pouring Roundup on me. <laughs> I don't feel like I'm growing at all. But according to what God says, when you're planted, we all help each other grow. Now, you can't grow if you run. You cannot grow. You can't flourish if you run. And a lot of times we don't want to get on a team. I don't like that person. That person irritates me. And what God is trying to do, now watch, so that the whole body, not just 20% of us, not the 20 who work, the 80 who don't, all of us in the room, the whole body is healthy, growing, and I love this phrase, Robin talked about it, and full of love. It's the only way it works. Now watch, you can I don't know if you believe this, this is just my opinion, I just don't think you can be a healthy, growing, loving Christian when you run all the time. You just can't. Because you really don't know love until you have to learn how to love the unlovable people. 
And you really don't know what growing up is until you have to hang out with people you don't want to grow up with. Because even the way we raise kids is, I can't wait till I'm 18, I'm out of here. <laughs> Honey, they will be your mom and pa till you die. You can leave all day long, and when you walk out the door to become an adult, according to the kingdom of God, they're still Ma and Paul. And you have to honor them even when you're 40. My parents sit on the front row, I'm 51, still honor them to this day. That it may, what God says in Ephesians 6, that it may go well with me. So the whole body growing together in love as everybody does its part. So here's what you have to know. Not only are people not your problem. People are your potential. It's in relationship of being planted together that I realize my full potential. Because you'll pull it out of me. My wife pulls it out of me. If I'm left to myself isolated, my best self never comes out. Because I will always just settle with mediocre. Now watch. I said mediocre for a reason because you may say, well, not me. I do better by myself. I flourish when I'm alone because I can really soar and get to where I need to get. That's me at the gym. I don't like working out with people at the gym. I don't want to go there and chit-chat. I don't want to go there to fellowship. I want to go for one thing, try not to be so fat. It doesn't work well, but that's the reason I go. And I go for one hour. I walk in the door, I nod at the person there, I go sit in the sauna for 20 minutes, I go and do a 40-minute workout that uh, wears me out, and then I go shower, I come home, I can hit my watch at about 59 minutes, and I'm done. Do that every day. I don't enjoy working out with other people, but I can tell you when I do work out with other people, they take me past what I think my potential is. I think my potential is I can only do 20 push-ups. But put Kyle Barry Hill in there with me, challenging me, calling me fat boy. I'll do 22. If I have to die, I'll do 22. Just because he's taunting me, going, I bet you can't do 22. Oh, I'll do 22. It may take me a month and a half. I'll do 22 just to prove something. Robin and I, in our young years, I don't encourage this at all. I don't encourage husband and wife to go to the gym together. We decided we would go together. Now, my personality is, if you'll let me be in charge, I can save your life. Her personality is, no human on this planet will control me. My personality is, I will, if you'll let me. Her personality is to whine and tell me what she doesn't like about her body and what she wants to achieve at the gym. My personality is, well, come with me. I'll get you in shape. Her personality is, I can't. You tell me what to do. I said, well, that's what a trainer does. They tell you what to do. I said, well, I, that's what I'm going to do. She said, I nobody to tell me what to do. I said, well, what do you want to do? She said, I want to hire a trainer. I said, well, why do you want to hire a trainer? He's just going to tell you what to do. And she said, well, I don't mind him telling me what to do. He's not my husband. I said, well, I... That's honest truth, is it not? Bless her heart, she needs prayer. <laughs> so I said to her, as any man would, I said, well, when we go to the gym, just act like I'm not your husband, pay me. I don't care, whatever you need to say to him, you can say to me, I'll just act like I'm not even married to you, I don't even know you, I'll even introduce myself every time you come in the door. You pay me the $180 a month for him to train you. She says, no, I want to pay for the trainer. So she pays for the trainer. Well, the trainer tells her what to do, tells her all the stuff she does. And I'm kind of pouting because I'm like, man, I wanted to work out with you and tell you what to do. She doesn't want me to tell her. She's a control freak, and I'm a control freak. I want to tell her what to do, and she doesn't want me to tell her what to do. So we go to the gym one day. We met up at the gym, and I said, well, can I just, and this is how kind she is. She does give occasionally. She said, well, today I'll let you train me. Oh, Man, it was like Scooby-Doo finding the gold. I was like, hallelujah. There was your Aggie. Hmm? I mean, I just, I was like, this is it. I'm just going to show her how good I am. I mean, I even puffed my chest up a little bit, you know. Got my biceps a little more swollen so I could kind of look like a trainer, sort of walking around like this with her, you know. Come on over here, honey. Let me teach you what this is. So we sat down. 
And I said, here's what I want you to do. I want you to do these tricep push downs because she was always whining about the back of her arm being flabby. And, and I was like, oh, just do these tricep push downs. And, and so I, I moved it over and I put it down. She said, well, I can't do that. I said, well, honey, you could. Just trust me, that's not that much. She said, I'm telling you, I can't do that. And I said, well, yeah, you can. I mean, I've been married to you. If you can't do that, you can't even birth a kid. <laughs> I mean, come, that's just not that hard. Well, I mean, we're having this conversation, are we not? She says, I can't. I said, look, I just want you to do, I said, here's what I want you to do. I said, just do eight of them. She said, honey, I'm telling you, I can't do eight of them. I said, I'm telling you as your husband, I'm 100% certain you could do eight of them. I, I'm telling you, that's too heavy. I'll never make eight. Then I have to start bargaining. Well, if you'll try to do eight, I'll rub your feet if you make it. <laughs> I mean, you know. And then I said this. I said, here's what let's do. I just want you for one time in your life to do as many as you can do. She said, I'll never make eight. I said, I don't care. Just do as many as you can do. Grit your teeth and just let it go. So I guess the spirit of Samson came over, and she just started going, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirty, forty, fifty, sixty, seventy, eighty, nineteen, twenty, twenty-one, twenty-two, twenty-three, twenty-four, twenty-five, twenty-six, seventy, twenty-eight, twenty-nine, thirty, thirty-one, thirty-two, thirty-three. 20, 40, 50, 60, 70, 80, 90, 20, 21, 22, 23, 24, 25, 26, 27, 28, 29, 30, 31, 32, 33, 40 of them. 40 of them. She's telling me, I can't do eight. You did 40 of them. I quit training her that day, never training you again. I just walked out. That's the problem with husbands and wives at the gym. In her mind, she, her, her mind, looking at the number, I can only do eight. But having someone there challenging that lie, challenging that thought, challenging that insecurity, challenging that moment caused her to do five times more than what she could do. So in your mind as a Christian, when you do life isolated and you live isolated in God, you never reach your potential because God says there's five times more in you that I want to do and I can't do it because you won't let anybody pull it out of you. And every time they're trying to pull out the potential, you get offended. Every time they try to pull out the potential, you run out the door. There's potential in every human in this room. And the reason God plants you in a body is to pull the potential out of you. Some of you in here are called to preach. Some of you in here are evangelists. Some of you in here want to do outreach. Some of you in here want to start a business. Some of you in here want to have a great life. There is potential. And if you'll let your brothers and sisters pull it out, you'll start a business. You'll, you'll open up a ministry. You'll go to downtown Atlanta and preach Jesus. If you just have people around you that help you reach your potential. That's why God plants you. There's men and women right now that help me be a better person. Sherry Garrett, if you don't know Sherry, on the second row, every Sunday she comes in, she encourages me. I was praying for you this week. God spoke to me this. And when she's done, I feel like Superman. I just feel like I could take the world over now. And, 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 and Patty Palmer, always putting stuff on Facebook. God bless our pastors, bless our leaders. I read that every, she posts it every morning and I read it. And I come to work just so pumped up. Just other people encouraging you, pumps you up for your potential. I can do it. Who wants to hang around with a moper? Damn. Anybody old enough to remember Gulliver's Travels, the cartoon? Oh no, we'll never make it. Remember that? Oh, no. And then Eeyore. <laughs> you know, nobody wants to hang out with Eeyore. Man, it just be a tigger. Just bounce around the room. Encourage each other's potential. That's why God plants you. Now, if you're a runner or a church hopper or a floater, I only just come when the wind blows. I'm not consistently planted. It's going to be hard for you to flourish, and it's going to be hard for you to reach your potential. Because God wants to pull it out of you. All right? Ephesians chapter 4 at the very end of the chapter, verse 31. Let's read 31 and 32. Get rid of all bitterness, rage, anger, harsh words, slander, for all types of evil and all types of evil behavior. You see, you can't even get along with each other if you're not willing to get rid of some stuff. How many of you in this room say, I got some stuff I could get rid of? Let's go back to that scripture one more time. Go back to 31 one more time. 
Get rid of bitterness. Is there anybody in your life right now you need to just forgive and let go of? They've hurt your feelings. They've ticked you off. Another church, another pastor, another human, an ex. Is there any rage? Is there anybody you'd like to kill right now? Maybe not kill them, but wound them and maim them. Maybe take a leg. You know, just something simple. Anger. Anger. Have you ever come to the house of God and left more mad when you left than when you came? Anger. Then it goes this, harsh words. Holy smoke. Harsh words. I've been married 26 years. I've said harsh words to Robin. Harsh words hurt. Harsh words hurt. Uh, you know, I, I've learned this being married with, and living with all girls, growing up with all girls in our home. Um, harsh words sound fun in the moment, but you can't ever get them back. Can't ever get them back. Once they're in the soul, man, they're in the soul. And you just end up having to eat those harsh words. Well, Paul says if you want to make this body work, you can't have harsh words. Slander, that means it'll never, you'll never be planted if you talk about people. Now, I'm not talking about talk about them in a nice way or you got an issue. That's what I'm just talking about meanly demeaning them and putting them down, rolling your eyes every time they walk in the room. Oh, I don't want to work with them. That's slander, as well as all types of evil behavior. Now, those things are, are in a category of evil behavior. How many of you, just help me, just raise your hand and be with me. How many of you ever, ever had harsh words? Okay, most of you. That's evil behavior. I know in today's society you can drop the F-bomb 42 times and you're a Christian, but not in the Bible. Harsh behavior doesn't work in the Bible. Now watch what it says because here's how we get along in the body. Instead, be kind to each other. Tender-hearted, that means I care more about you than myself. Forgiving one another just as God through Christ forgave you. Being planted allows you to receive forgiveness and offer it. 1 John chapter 1 says, if you really want to know the power of the blood of Jesus, it's recognized through fellowship. And the blood of Jesus Christ that cleanses us from all sin, it's recognized in fellowship. Your cleansing of sin is recognized in community. How do I really know the power of forgiveness if I don't have brothers and sisters who look at my failure and say, I forgive you? I'm telling you, there's power when you hear those words. I have failed as a man. There's power when you hear the words, I forgive you. And you look somebody in the face that's wounded you, and you say, you know what, I forgive you. It, it's, it's power in a body because it's the place you receive forgiveness. Anybody ever messed up before? Doesn't it feel good when the people you wounded pat you on the back and say, you know what, it's okay, I love you. We'll get through this. I forgive you. I mean, it's healing. It just like makes you just want to keep moving through life. But at the same time, it gives you a chance being planted it, because you have to stay long enough to get wounded to offer or give forgiveness. It allows you to give it back to somebody else. So the environment that we're creating at Believer's Church is it's an environment of forgiveness. I don't care what you've done. I forgive you, and I would ask for the same back. You forgive me, and we, we create an environment to where the blood of Jesus Christ is recognized together. But it's hard to understand the power of forgiveness if every time you're offended, you run. Or every time you're hurt, you stay home. Or every time something goes bad, you just start pouting and stay out of church for six more months. Just trying to work through it. The best place to work through your hurts is in the body of Christ with other people. Now let me ask this question. At Believer's Church, how many of you love it when you're forgiven? Raise your hand. Okay. Now how many of you are willing to offer it back to other people? Yeah, that's what it takes. Uh, it, it takes me willing to offer forgiveness back. Um, if you've been here long enough, you know my personality. My personality is you can be talking to me one minute, and my mind goes off a whole other direction, like squirrel. <laughs> now, I've trained myself over time to learn how to pay attention. I've trained my, I'm not always great at it, but I, I've had to train myself. I've had to train myself to be a better listener. Because sometimes when people are talking to me, my mind's going a million miles an hour and I'm fixing the world. You know, I mean, I don't know if you've ever met people like that. That's me. It, it, and it's not that I'm thinking, it's not that I don't care about you, but it can come across that way. So if I've ever offended you that way, forgive me. And I'm really trying to be better, but you can help me be better by helping me be better. <laughs> Listen to me, boy. 
Okay, yeah, I'm sorry. Hey, I'm back. Hey, I'm back. I'm back. I'm back. You know, helping one another. Uh, Robin, if you don't know this about Robin, and you don't have to come up and apologize to her. She's pretty good with this. She's been deaf in one ear since she was born. But over our tenure of 20 years pastoring, I've heard people say to me, I just feel like she ignores me a lot. Like I'll call out and she'll just keep walking. And then I have to tell him uh, it's because she only has so low hearing. Sometimes we'll call her Robin and she's like, because she can't tell where sound comes from. It's fun when we're playing hide and seek. She can't ever find us. <laughs> but, but there have been people that have, that have gotten upset at her because they felt like she was purposefully ignoring them because they didn't know she was deaf. And so when they spoke to her, or sometimes they speak, and she has to go, pardon me, and she turns her good ear because, you know, if you're speaking into her, her deaf side, she can't hear you well. So you have to just be in an environment that understands we all have different quirks. We all have personality quirks. We all have things we're really good at and things we're terrible at. So I just say let's accentuate the things we're great at and where we're terrible, just offer forgiveness because everybody in the room wants to flourish. Amen? And let's conclude with this. I'm going to ask Michael to come up. I'm going to get ready to ask you a question in a minute. Ephesians chapter 2, a couple more verses back. And let's end in Ephesians chapter 2. And I want to start reading in verse 4. Ephesians chapter 2, verse 4. But God is so rich in mercy. Aren't you glad for that? He's so rich in mercy. And He loved us so much that even though we were dead because of sins, He, get, he gave us life when He raised Christ from the dead. Underline this in your Bible. It is only by God's grace that you've been saved. For He raised us from the dead along with Christ, seated us with Him in heavenly realms because we are united with Christ Jesus. Here's the verse I want to hold on to. And the reason He gave us grace and mercy is so God can point to, all, to us in all future ages as an example of the incredible wealth of His grace and kindness toward us that He has shown <clears throat> in all He has done for us who are united in Christ Jesus. When you're being planted, here's my last point, it allows the world to experience the masterpiece of grace. Being planted lets the world see God's grace. Because they say, how can you stay there when those people are so rude to you? Grace. How can you be so nice to them? Grace. How can you love someone who's talked about you? Grace. How can you get along with people so different than the way you worship? Grace. So when we're planted in a body, it spits into the eyes of Lucifer of the masterpiece of grace. When you run, grace is not exploited. Grace is not put on display. But when you stay together and you plant together and you're in it together, it allows you to be part of the painting of God to this generation. I love my parents' testimony. They've been in three churches their entire life. The one they grew up got saved in, basically. And then Brother Arnold, then they planted the next ones. Aren't you glad that you have shepherds who founded this church? They didn't found this because they were angry. They didn't start this church because they got bitter at another ministry. They didn't run here because some other preacher hurt their feelings. This church was planted in July of 1990 because a man and a woman of God said, God is sending us to Atlanta. So I want to tell you something about Believer's Church if you're new. Uh, it's been here since July of 1990. It's 2016, but the root of the tree was planting. It wasn't started out of bitterness, anger, rage. It was started out of being planted on this corner. I've asked my dad several times, Dad, why don't you move? Why don't you get a better location maybe? Well, you know what he always tells me? Son, I can't leave. God planted me on that corner. Well, Dad, why don't you go, man, you know, if you get in a shopping plaza or get somewhere closer to I-20, do you know, he would always say this, he said, well, son, I'd do it, but God planted me on that corner. 
This corner has been planted. And here's what I'm asking you today. Are you willing to plant here? If you've never made this your home, would you be willing to? Your home. I may not be a perfect pastor, but I'll help you flourish. I'll challenge you. I'll pull out the potential in you. I'll help you get where God wants you to get. I'll walk the journey with you. Robin will walk the journey with you. If you fall, I'll pick you up, dust you off. If you offend me, I'll forgive you. If I offend you, I'll ask for forgiveness. But I can promise you this at Believer's Church. If you'll plant here, we will do life together. And when we bump into a wall, we'll all turn to the Holy Spirit and say, Help us and get forward. If you're looking for a home, I would just like to encourage you with this. If you're visiting today, you're looking for a church, um, I would love to have you here. But most importantly, I want you to find somewhere you can plant. Somewhere Jesus wants you. And you can say, Jesus, where do you want me? And now if it's at Believer's Church, I welcome you with open arms. Our people will welcome you. We'll treat you like family. And then, here's what I want to say. If you're a member here, and you've been part of this ministry a long time, or you've just kind of come on board in the last year, I want to challenge you. We cannot flourish if you hold back your potential. We can't. Some of you have potential to give more. Some of you have potential to serve. Some of you have potential to lead. You heard Robin talk about our B groups are launching. Guess what? We need people that can lead a B group. I want to pull that potential out of you. Would you open up your home and let us put a group in it? Would you be willing to lead a group? We'll provide the notes. We'll help you. We're not asking you to be perfect. We're just trying to pull the potential out of you. We'll help you get to where God wants you. Do you love children? Let me pull the potential out of you. We've got great places you can serve. Do you just love hugging people? We've got a great ministry and first impressions. But I want to be a pastor that pulls potential out of you. I'm not asking you to be perfect to serve here. I'm just asking you, can I borrow your potential? I'll help you get there. You may not think you can do eight push-ups. I'll help you do 22. If you'll hang in there, I'll inspire you to be, to be great at what God's called you to do. Here's what I'd love to say, and I'm not threatened by your potential at all. I want you to be the best you can be, and I want you to succeed. Here's what I want to ask you. I want every eye to look up to the screen, and I want you to ask yourself this question. Holy Spirit, what is it you want to say to me through this message? It's the best question I could ask you. Holy Spirit, what is it you want to say to me through this message? Would you bow your heads for a moment? As Michael's playing, I want you to just let that question sink in. Our prayer team is coming up now. There's people here that are spirit-filled. There's people here that have been trained to pray for you to lay hands on you, to agree with you. Our elders are here. Our prayer teams are here. And they purposely are here to put their faith with your faith. In just a minute, I'm going to ask you to be honest about this question. Is there something the Holy Spirit wants to speak to you through the message you've just heard? And if there is, I'm going to ask you to come up and let us pray for you. And just let us stand with you. Maybe it's about your marriage, your health, a child, the money. It can be any need you have. If you're afraid to come up front or you just feel a little timid, hey, when we dismiss, just come up then. We'll be glad to pray over you then. I want everybody to stand up with me, if you will, now. I'm going to pray a prayer over you. As I pray, I'm just going to release you. Then Michael's going to sing that song we sang during worship. Love came down and rescued me. Love came down and set me free. He's going to sing through that a few times. And as he leads that, if you need prayer during his song while he leads us, would you worship together with Michael? And would you get out of your seat if you need prayer and come and let's let the Holy Spirit touch you if you have felt challenged this morning to plant your life. Hallelujah. Michael, if you'll lead it. Come on, let's sing with him. If you need prayer, you come on now as Michael leads it. Hallelujah.